Welcome to WMNF on 88.5 FM and WMNF.org. I'm Sean Canan. COVID-19 cases are surging in Florida and across other parts of the country. Today, we're going to talk to a doctor about coronavirus infections in the Tampa Bay region. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, cited in the Tampa Bay Times, 228,000 children have been diagnosed with COVID-19 in Florida. That's about 9% of the population. That's an important number to pay attention to with many Tampa Bay area school districts beginning the school year today. And there are different rules when it comes to face masks in schools. We'll try to clear up some of that confusion this hour. Later in the show, I'm going to take your phone calls. In the meantime, you can email your comments to dj at wmnf.org or text 813-433-0885. Please sign your name if you text. Well, let's bring on our guest right now. Dr. Jason Wilson is an associate medical director of the ER at Tampa General Hospital. Welcome back to WMNF, Dr. Wilson. Hey, Sean. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm so glad you can join us on this important first day of school for many people and during this very um, concerning COVID-19 surge in Florida and in Tampa Bay. Let's start with me asking you to tell our listeners what you're seeing at Tampa General. What are your interactions with COVID-19 patients there? Sure. What we're seeing at Tampa General is uh, very concerning. What we're seeing is a very similar to where we were last summer but in many ways worse. Uh, the volume of patients we're seeing is actually higher. Uh, the, uh, the, the way they're presenting is worse. They're often sicker patients now, and they're much younger patients than we were seeing uh, just a year ago. Uh, you know, one year ago, we thought a lot about uh, why someone might get sick from COVID and why someone else might not. So we thought about, you know, age and diabetes and other things. And, and now really what we're seeing are, uh, and what I'm learning from conversations with patients who come in with COVID is mo most of our patients, as you've probably heard, are, are unvaccinated at this point and really filling up hospitals. So maybe if I could just simplify things in saying, if you don't want to end up in the hospital, probably the best thing you could do would be to get vaccinated. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I, I know we're starting to say that message more and more, but I'm still not sure how, like, to us from a hospital setting, how obvious that message is. You know, the, the thing that helps us decide whether this is a patient who's going to get sick from COVID or not get sick from COVID is really whether they're vaccinated or not vaccinated. So not only do you get that huge amount of protection against even getting COVID, even with the Delta variant, there is significant protection against getting infection at all, um, just with the vaccine, that even if you do get infection, the likelihood of ending up in the hospital is incredibly low. And the likelihood of ending up in the ICU or on a ventilator is exceedingly rare. And most of those patients are patients who unfortunately have other immune problems, things like transplants and uh, chemotherapy for cancer, things like that. Continuing on that line, then essentially what you're saying is even so for, for cancer patients or for people who have had transplants, even if they've taken the responsible step of getting vaccinated, the fact that there are so many unvaccinated people and the fact that this pandemic is continuing, really they're becoming almost like the sacrificial uh, patients, these people are getting sick, even though they've been responsible, they're still getting sick and many of them are dying. So, so we're essentially as a society choosing to sacrifice people who've had tra organ transplants or people who are immunosuppressed in other ways like cancer patients. Yeah, and you make a really good point, Sean, because the, the best thing we can do to protect people who either aren't eligible for vaccination yet, uh, that's kids, right, kids under 12, uh, people who, even though they got the vaccine, just don't have the immune system to respond to the vaccine, really by definition, that's what a transplant patient has to have is an immune system that won't reject their transplanted organ. Uh, the best thing we can do is to go out and get vaccinated to protect those other people uh, who will not respond well if they were to get sick from COVID. What can you tell us about the difference between the Delta variant and previous variants of the coronavirus biochemically and biostructurally? How is it different and how is it different when it comes to transmissibility and whether patients get sicker? Sure. So there's been a number of variants of COVID at this point of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and that is to be expected. 
infected. Uh, viruses, you know, uh, replicate over and over again. Uh, they're going to have mutations. They're going to have different strains. Uh, we, we've tracked over 40 strains just at Tampa General through genetic sequencing that patients come in with. Now, some of those differences in those strains are very small molecular differences in what's called the spike protein, uh, which is kind of the major protein site on the outside of the wall of the virus that we are targeting with antibodies. And every time that spike protein changes a little bit, then there is some question as to whether or not treatments or antibodies are going to be quite as effective, or if the virus might have gotten a little leg up in the arms race and be able to get into cells a little bit more. Now, I, I mentioned there were 40 variants we had found at Tampa General. That doesn't mean that all those variants are as concerning as Delta. Uh, the CDC and the WHO watch this very closely and they identify the variants that are concerning. They actually call them variants of concern because they're shown to be different in some meaningful clinical way or they transmit more. There's about four of those right now and, uh, and Delta is the predominant one. We hear so much about it because it is really so transmissible. It's probably five to six times more transmissible than the previous sort of regular SARS-CoV-2 COVID virus which we already knew was two to three times more transmissible than the flu. Our guest is Dr. Jason Wilson. He's Associate Medical Director of the ER at Tampa General Hospital, and you're listening to WMNF 88.5 FM. It's 10:12 in the morning. We're talking about the spike in coronavirus cases and COVID-19 infections uh, all over the Tampa Bay area and in Florida and elsewhere in other parts of the country. And I'm, I want to focus on children for just a bit because you mentioned earlier that if you're 12 or if you're under the age of 12 you aren't even eligible for a vaccination yet and Florida leads the nation in hospitalization rate of kids who've been infected with the coronavirus that rate is 0.76 per 100,000 residents so what do COVID-19 numbers look like right now in Florida and in the U.S. or in local counties or Tampa General what what kinds of numbers can you give us for kids? Yeah, so, you know, what we've kind of heard throughout this uh, natural history of the virus is that kids seem to have some protection against COVID, which we know is not really true that they're protected from getting COVID. You know, fortunately, they have not gotten quite as sick. But what we have seen over this last couple of weeks is that there is so much prevalence of COVID out there and that elderly people are vaccinated some middle-aged people and over are vaccinated. So where do we start to see COVID appear with that high prevalence? We start to see more cases in kids. We start to, when, when there's just more COVID out there, more kids are gonna get COVID, which means more kids are gonna get sick. And so while the hospitals overall in this area have had very low numbers of pediatric hospitalizations up until recently, now we start to see some double digit numbers for hospitalizations. Um, our major children's hospital in this area, which is over in St. Petersburg, which is the all children's site, uh, is now seeing double digit hospitalizations for the first time of pediatric cases. It's starting to see uh, pediatric cases of children on ventilators and in ICUs. And so we know that just like with young people, if there's enough of the virus out there, then eventually, just by probability, we're gonna get enough people sick that they're gonna have serious and significant outcomes and continue to spread virus around our community. What do we know about what's called long COVID? Uh, people's getting, people having symptoms just months and months after they were initially sick, and how does it affect children or adults differently? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. We, we don't know if it is different for, for, for children and adults. Like, I think what we're learning right now that we're starting to unfortunately see a higher volume of pediatric cases is that, A, you probably can have some uh, long COVID or, or downstream auto, you know, immune uh, sequelae or downstream just, you know, physiological deconditioning uh, from COVID. You can have that in adults for sure. We've known that because we've had so many COVID cases in adults for a long time. Uh, but it's starting to look like you can have this in children too, which of course is very concerning. Um, you know, the last thing we want to do is, uh, you know, give our, our children downstream effects or downstream problems they're going to have to face later in life. 
Uh, but with adults, you know, what we know is this is a physiologically debilitating disease. And, um, you know, for many of them, for anybody who goes in the ICU or the hospital for a long time, uh, it's going to take a long time to recover. So uh, respiratory problems, uh, cardiovascular problems, uh, fatigue, uh, and sometimes some neurological memory or psychiatric problems as well. Let's talk about masks for a while. The CDC recommended recently that everyone should wear a mask indoors um, over the age of two. And so when they recommended that, I guess a lot of people thought, well, maybe that means that people will in over the age of two in schools will be required to wear masks. And it isn't really panning out like that. The governor of Florida is insisting that there not be a mask mandate. Several counties are going against his um, threats if I can say that, uh, to, and, and requiring masks, allowing some parents to opt out. What do you think would be the best strategy when it comes to masks? First, what would you recommend for people in general, but then specifically if you have any recommendations for schools? Yeah, this has been a frustrating uh, topic. It's been a frustrating topic because I, you know, I promised my 12-year-old uh, in May that um, when he got vaccinated, that two weeks after that, we could stop wear a mask and go to some baseball games and, and do some stuff. And, uh, and, you know, so that, that was my promise to him. And, and you know, the promise held up for. Our guest is Dr. Jason Wilson, associate medical director of the ER at Tampa General Hospital. Looks like we're having some, some Zoom issues right now. Um, maybe we'll try to reconnect with Dr. Wilson. In the meantime, what I'm going to for, do for is. For a couple of weeks. And yeah, I think that Dr. Wilson is, is having some buffering problems and we'll, we'll try to reconnect with him and uh, he'll let us know when he's back on. But let me play this, uh, this quick, um, this is from Manatee Schools yesterday. This is the lawyer of Manatee County Schools talking about why his county feels that th there's, they're not allowed to institute a mask mandate in Manatee County Schools. My legal opinion is one, the executive order from the governor, which is 21-175, and also section D, students may wear masks or facial coverings as a mitigation measure. It says may, it doesn't say they, they must. It, doesn't, it, it gives the flexibility. And therefore, if students may wear them, it, it would prohibit a mask mandate. Again, that's my opinion. And Mr. Dye has expressed that same opinion as well. Well, that was some audio from yesterday's Manatee County School Board meeting, and they are, that county's lawyers say that they are not allowed to mandate masks, but other counties feel that there is a little window there for them to mandate masks for everyone with the parents' ability to opt out. And we have Dr. Jason Wilson back from Tampa General Hospital. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, hopefully this is uh, working better. Yeah, sounds great. Great. Yeah, you know, I think I was talking about the frustration that, uh, you know, our family has had and my, me and my kid have had. I had promised him that, uh, you know, he got vaccinated in May uh, and that two weeks later we would stop wearing masks, uh, you know, as a, as a family and, uh, you know, start going to some baseball games and doing some things. And, and that held up for, for a couple of weeks, that promise. But as we got closer to the uh, school year here, um, obviously things started to shift. And, you know, what I reminded him of is that, you know, whether there was a mask mandate or not a mask mandate, there was certainly no mandate against wearing masks. And that for us, um, you know, looking at the data, especially around the Delta variant, as it got closer, they looked like even vaccinated people could spread Delta asymptomatically. We would probably need to go back to mask and indoor settings. And so, you know, today, uh, you know, he went to school again and uh, had the mask right back on. Unfortunately, even though we don't have a uh, formal um, full mandate here in Hillsborough County, I did notice that quite a few of the uh, middle school kids were wearing their masks and, uh, you know, it is an opt out at least uh, requiring a form to, to come out of the mask. Um, you know, so that's that's where we are. We're, we're right back where we were when the school year ended and, uh, you know, having many of the same discussions we were having uh, just previous to the school year last year beginning, unfortunately. What can you tell us about the percentage of people who are testing positive, say in Hillsborough County or in Florida, how that number has changed over time and what numbers should we look at? What's the target? Where, where should we be heading? Yeah, you know, we really want to get both the positivity rate under 5% and also the new cases per day under five per 100,000. And so if you go back to May of a year and a half, whatever, a year and three months ago, that May, 
we were kind of right there. And so we were at that turning point of which way to go. And some things reopened and some things got worse and we searched and we got uh, much worse. We saw double digit positivity and double digit new cases per day. Uh, things were bad for a long time and they were starting to return back to very close to those numbers. Around this May, we were about uh, that 5% positivity rate and getting really close to that 500,000 new cases per day for um, the incidents. Unfortunately, that world seems like many, many, many moons ago now because now we're at over 20% positivity and we're hanging in the high 70s to 80s per 100,000 cases in this area. Or if you think about it another way, about 1,000 cases, you know, um, it, as a seven day average. So, really, not at all where we want to be. So, you move from a place of containment of virus to a place of understanding there's really virus around you everywhere at this point. And you have to try to uh, go from containment to mitigation control. And what, you know, that's a big part of the reason why you're seeing masks come back. Uh, a, because so few people are vaccinated. B, because we have a very transmissible variant right now. Um, and C, because vaccinated people can probably spread asymptomatic virus with this strain. Our guest is Dr. Jason Wilson, Associate Medical Director of the ER at Tampa General Hospital. I think you're super busy, so I think that you are, we're running out of time with you right now. But I, let me just ask one last question, if, if we have time. Um, some school districts are no longer requiring students who may have been exposed to COVID-19 to quarantine at home. What effect might that have and what would you recommend to school districts? Yeah, you know, this year is going to be a, a tough place um, because we've got some kids who are vaccinated, some kids who are not vaccinated, some staff who are vaccinated, some staff who are not vaccinated. What we do know is that last year we had a quarantine rule in place and overall, schools did not drive a community outbreak. So overall, masks and quarantines seem to work reasonably well. Uh, what becomes concerning is that if you have unvaccinated people gathered together and don't have quite those same effects, uh, mandates uh, uh, in place, then you start to worry about the opposite happening, that a school outbreak could drive a community outbreak. Um, so certainly, you know, we, we are concerned and, you know, the CDC overall would still recommend quarantining positive pay, uh, people uh, for 10 days from the beginning of symptoms. And that's probably still the right strategy. Uh, you know, the, the question here is, you know, about vaccination. And we, we just know our numbers are very low right now for vaccination status. Well, Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for coming back on WMNF. Yeah, no problem. Happy to come on anytime. Sorry, it's always about this. Yeah, I know. We'll talk about something else in the future, I hope. Uh, well, Dr. Jason Wilson is Associate Medical Director of the ER at Tampa General Hospital and an Associate Professor at USF Health. And we'll be right back after this short music break. We'll talk more